Hello, Kim Gould from Love Your Design here. I wanted to share this video with you for a couple of reasons. One, I want to give you a positive take on what's happening on the planet at the moment. I see a lot of negativity and I see a lot of fear, quite frankly, and worry and anxiety. What I can really clearly see is that there's this birth of a new consciousness that we are engaged with. One of the things that I do in the Love Your Design community is every week I do a weekly wrap of what I see of the transit. So it goes into a lot more depth than what you might see, for example, in my weekly blog post. And the, the whole point of bringing that information together for people is to help people to engage with what's present and here for us to do. It's not like something's coming at us from 2027 and we're kind of waiting for it to happen. It's happening now and it, there are there are really positive things that each one of us can engage with at the moment in terms of giving birth to this new consciousness. So I wanted to give you some insight into that. I also wanted to give you a little bit of a view of what goes on inside the community. Uh, you'll also see in the video um, where I actually go through some of the materials that are inside the community as well. Um, also, just let me say that if you look at what I'm doing in this video and say, I thought I knew what human design is, but what is this woman doing? The community has a whole bunch of courses that take you through from, you know, type, strategy, authority, right through to understanding, you know, the role of the dwarf planets, um, uh, progressions, which I call holographic human design layers, uh, or a whole lot of stuff right from, through from the, and they're very, very um, detailed uh, practical hands-on kind of courses uh, so it takes you through the whole process so my members in the community will watch this video and know what I'm talking about because they've done those courses and that's something that you can have as well if you would like to come in and kind of get to explore human design I think more deeply but also to see the potential that's there to do a whole lot more with it than most people know about I think that's it um, oh one more thing the software that I use in this video is my software. It's called Taraka.io. I'll put the link down below. And I refer a few times to Hilary Barrett. I tend to, that's kind of just my, you know, quick grab I Ching for exploring the meaning of the gates. Uh, exploring the meaning of the gates is <laughs> one of my kind of passions. It just so happens that in this video, I mostly just refer to Hilary Barrett. I'll put the link to that book below as well. It's kind of my fave of all the I Ching's. So enjoy and um, yeah, just um, I just think this is such an amazing time and um, I just wanted to share my take on that with you. So I hope you enjoy it. Good morning and it's Wednesday, so we all know what that means. And big one today, uh, we're going to be looking at the eclipse chart and also some other things that are kind of constellated around that. Uh, I will come back and do separate videos for you on Neptune in the 25 and Pluto in the 41. So I'm not going to talk about those in this video, except perhaps tangentially. Uh, I do want to start with the USA chart because we know that the eclipse is going to, it will actually have its, I don't know what the word is, apex in Mexico, just uh, south of the US border. It will pass over the US border into Texas and continue up and into Canada. So obviously, you know, the US is kind of a focal point now. And there's a lot going on in the US at the moment in terms of um, uh, Trump litigation, certainly. Uh, in terms of, of people really starting to come out and say, uh, you know, if Trump gets in, it's going to be the end of democracy. And other people saying, even if Trump doesn't get in, there's a fundamental tear in the social contract in the USA, which I think is a really interesting and more fundamental idea than arguing about one huckster who has garnered a lot of attention. So um, yeah, I think the deeper issues relate to the social contract. Now let's have a look at this USA chart because there's some really interesting things going on. I do just want to mention a couple of technical things. One is you can see here I've said, uh, I've called it as per Dane Roger. That's because, just going over here, there's a lot of controversy about the time. Um, 
was it 5 p.m.? It was late afternoon that the Declaration of Independence was adopted. Most charts will use 5 p.m. Dane Rudger, who is was an exceptional astrologer, uh, says that he has done a rectification to bring it to 5.13.55. And that has always been the chart that I've used. However, in the 5 p.m. chart, you can see here I've got it at 5.13.55. Um, if we take the 5 p.m. chart, the moon is in gate 57, line 6, which is also quite interesting because that brings it really close to the eclipse. So in any case, it's going to be um, really affected. So I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, firstly, the places where the eclipse will most impact on the USA in terms of this chart are the design layer, Sun in 51, Mars in 51. Mars conjunct the Sun in gate 51, the gate of shock and awe <laughs> um, and terror in gate 51. I think that's quite interesting. And we've got Saturn and the Earth and possibly depending on what time we want to use the moon for um, in gate 57. Now this is where the sun and earth will be on the eclipse. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, actually, the, uh, if you don't know about this, I think this is quite astonishing actually. If we have a look, so we've got here in the 57, we've got the earth and Saturn and some other things. If we go up to gate 20, we've got design Uranus. So Uranus is in gate 16 and gate 20. Now Uranus is important in the US chart because it's, you know, the land of the free, um, the individual, or all of the things that Uranus stands for. So we've got the Earth and Saturn, stability, security, um, you know, building something of value over time, uh, and Uranus, planet of freedom. So you can see that Saturn, Uranus, um, uh tension there do we want to have um revolution or do we want to build something stable and secure that saturn uranus thing going on now i just wanted to let you know that between july 2026 and september or actually it'll go past this time but around september 27 uranus is going to be moving between these two gates the 16 and the 20. so it's going to be in that period, the Uranus of, uh, Uranus return, sorry, um, which happens at 84 years for a person. And this will be what the, I don't know how many, um, Uranus cycle in 1860, um, probably the second or the third, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't do the math on the, on the fly. But it's big. It's a big deal. And it's going to bring to the fore over the next few years this problem of do we want to be Saturnian? Do we want to, want to be the the um, world, you know, the serious world leaders? Or do we want to be the, the Tea Party, right, the crazy revolutionaries that overthrow governments? That's going to be a thing for the US over the next few years. Um, the other thing is, too, in February 22, as in... 2022, February 2022, um, US had its Pluto return in gate 60. So that was obviously a big time. Now also um, the US has Chiron in gate 51 with, I might mention, the Sun and Mars, a blind spot. <laughs> Just leave a moment for that to settle. Um, okay, Chiron in Gate 51 with the Sun and Mars. And Chiron has been in Gate 51. So this is the US Chiron return has been happening for the last year or so. So we've got that as well. And and honestly, the whole thing about really finding um, really finding that blind spot in the way in which, you know, the, the, you think about the way these waves of shock have been coming on the US and how they've had to deal with that. Uh, what else have I got here? There was one more thing I wanted to talk about. Hang on.
Oh, I'm so pleased I've already put it in. There is a centaur which doesn't have a name, 2003, which was the discovery date, C01, it's called. The provisional name for that is Assange. That's just a name that someone suggested. However, it's in Gate 51 with these other um, things, Sun, Mars and Chiron. It's also in Gate 42, which is going to be significant um, over the next few weeks as well. well. I'll come back to that. But I mention this because it talks about um, detecting blind spots in its own zeitgeist. Um, freedom loving, truth seeking, um, an attachment to the 1960s, the idealism of the 1960s. I think that's interesting. So anyway, that um, that's sitting there as well. Um, and I think that's a really, I, I actually believe that I do believe that the US has a leading role, perhaps in terms of its capacity for its growing capacity for introspection into the roots of violence and division. Um, if not, also, I, I suspect also uh, colonialism, <laughs> decolonization. And I partly say that because um, on the Uranus return, when Uranus is in gate 16, Maki Maki, which is the planet, the dwarf planet that relates to decolonization, is going to be sitting in gate 48. It's there now. It's going to go back to 18, kind of, they do tend to move around between gates, the dwarf planets, but it will mostly be in gate 48 between now and 2027, the planet of decolonization. So that's also a really big deal in the US process. Okay, let's go to the eclipse chart now. And you can see that we've got the 51.5 and the 57.5, um, the sun, earth and moon. And then also the nodes, 51.1 and 57.1. And if we click on the 51, we can see that we also have Chiron. So what we have is the Sun conjunct Chiron in 51.5. Now, firstly, I talked about Chiron a couple of weeks back. Chiron is a blind spot. Let's not talk about it as some kind of wound that we're never going to recover from. Let's think of it as a blind spot that's being revealed, right? And the blind spot causes obviously some kind of wounding, something we can't see in our lives. Now, I think this plays in really strongly to the fact that Mercury is sitting in gate 42, line 5 on the eclipse which is also exactly the point where Eris is. And Eris is a dwarf planet that represents a blind spot, a place where uh, we, let me tell a story, over the weekend, uh, sorry, last week I was down with my son in Melbourne and he was trying to sort something out at work um, and he had asked his boss to do something and his boss hadn't done it. And because his boss hadn't done this thing, Cameron was desperately trying to fix the situation, but he really couldn't because he couldn't do it unless his boss had done this thing. And then his boss was like, why didn't you fix the thing, Cameron? And he didn't want to say to his boss, well, you know, I did ask you to do that thing. And because you didn't do that thing, I couldn't fix it. And so he kind of had to shoulder some of the blame, which was quite unfair because he worked, he worked on his day off to try to fix it over Easter. Anyway. I said to him, this is classic Eris, because the story, I have talked to you about the story of Eris, I think this is such an important thing. The story of Eris is that she gets blamed for the Trojan War and it was always Zeus. It was always Zeus who created the Trojan War, right? This is the story of our, you know, our, our world right now. Stop blaming Eris, people. She just felt sad because she missed out on going to the wedding. She just threw an apple into the wedding. Zeus started the war. So there's something here about, um, and, and this also comes back to Maki Maki as well, this idea that I call the missing observer syndrome, which is that we have been so trained to observe things from the point of view of Zeus let's just say Zeus as a, as a placeholder for all that Zeus represents. We have been so trained to look at things from the perspective 
of Zeus that we have lost our capacity, i.e. developed a blind spot for a whole lot of what is actually happening. Now, what that leads us to is a situation where Zeus can do a whole lot of things undercover because we simply are blind now to that activity or we see that activity as being legitimate for our good rather than for our bad. Um, I just want to check something. Okay, I've been looking at a TNO called a Trans-Neptunian object called Borisisi sitting in Gate 25. I haven't looked at it for years, but I had a look um, the other day. Let me see if I can find my notes. Hang on a minute. Found it. Scribbled at the bottom of the page. Uh, deception. Deception from religion and science, particularly relating to science, the uh, comb combination of science and industry and government, potentially also media. Um, but it relates to a kind of a cultish belief in, um, I would say, kind of corporatism and the corporatism of government. So, for example, the idea that we um, believe that the government is acting for our good, right, um, which, you know, for... <laughs> For most of us growing up, we believed in that and probably mostly we still do. But what we're seeing, in fact, is Boris Sisi sitting in gate 25 right now. Um, so on the eclipse in 25 line 3, which I might add is the point where Saturn and Neptune are going to be conjunct next year, uh, 2026. So I'm really watching that point very carefully. But that sense of the veil falling away, if you like, um, our, our tendency to question rather than to assume that something is good for us. We can see it in, um, and again, you know, this is not, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but we can see it in the anti-vax movement, right? The, the questioning of whether the vaccine is actually healthy. And look, I don't want to get into vax, anti-vax at all. I don't want to get into that. And I'm not saying anything about that debate. But what I want to say is that movement, that questioning of um, the anti-vax, of the vaccinations for COVID also has that kind of culty energy to it and also sees the people who have the vaccinations as being under the influence in a cultish kind of way of, you know, believing that science will always have your best interest, science, technology, industry will always have your best interest at heart. That is a really central key at the moment. And we see it also, I think, in the questioning of um, what's going on in um, Gaza at the moment and the questioning of, uh, it's more than questioning, obviously, of how our governments here in Australia, certainly, and I know also in the US and in Israel as well, just in the last um, few days, it's been extraordinary protests there around the cult of believing in, I'm, I'm gonna say the military industrial um, complex, um, whatever you wanna call that as well. So I think Boris Sisi is in a sense, a precursor to Neptune and Gate 25, pulling the veil away from the um, so that we can see what is actually causing things to happen. One of the things with this missing observer syndrome, which is a syndrome where we do not observe things from our own perspective, um, we take the observational stance of someone else in preference to our own, which is what we've been trained to do in, in the patriarchal system. I think that... <laughs> The recovery from that process means that we can actually uh, really recognise the fact that when things happen, it's not just nature making these, I mean, making these things happen, it's people, it's Zeus operating undercover and we've been acting as if, because we've been led to believe, we've been acting 
as if um, we it, these things are beyond our control and they are not. So I really think Borisisi is incredibly significant. Now, I, I have mentioned already in a post um, in the community, Manwe, the Lord of Grace, recorrection of karma, um, correcting karma. Um, I, I, yeah, I just really can't speak more about that. That's pretty clear. I just want to check actually um, where karma is because it... Oh, yeah, it's in 27. So karma in 27 is making a channel with Halmiya. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Let's go back up to the top again. So we looked at the US. I just um, I just want to talk about um, what do we start with? Let's start with Mercury retrograde. So Mercury is retrograde in gates three. It's gone retrograde now, three and then 42 and then 51. Um, and we can see we can see on the eclipse it's in 42.5 with Eris. Now, um, on the 11th, so jumping forward a little bit, on the 11th of April, it's going to be conjunct the sun in 42, line 2. And I was just having a look at what 42, line 2 says, and it says, the channel to the spirits is open and you have a blessing of unshakable intrinsic value. You can invest your full self in response to change. Now, remember, Gate 51.5 is all about um, uh, the, the arousing of um, the arousing nature of shock to wake us up. And think about what I was saying about Borisisi and about Chiron, waking us up, getting us out of that missing observer syndrome, bringing us back to our own perspective, our own capacity to recognize what's really going on. We also have, um, I think, interesting, we have Pan here in, uh, we're down here in 42. We have Pan here in 42. Now, whenever I look at Pan, Pan is the wild energy. Pan, yeah. Pan was one of the kind of precursors to the idea of the devil because the wild, natural, earth-based um, aspects of humanity and feminine, I suppose, and sexual aspects of humanity were demonised by the Christian religion. So Pan represents, in a sense, those um, demonised aspects of humanity Whenever I see Pan, I always want to go looking for Midas. Now, I know um, I thought everyone knew who Midas was, but then I discovered that that's not actually the case. So I'll tell you the story of Midas. King Midas was quite aspirational and he's, he wanted to have more wealth and more influence. So he was actually offered, I don't know how many wishes, but let's just say one, and he said, what I want is that everything I touch will turn to gold. Now, the important thing here is I think that he had a desire that his touch would create wealth and that wealth in turn would create influence. But what happened was in the story, he touched his daughter, his beloved daughter, and she turned to gold. She no longer was his daughter. She was gold. He, he loved his garden and he went out and touched his roses and they turned to gold so there was no longer the perfume and the the living essence had gone from these things he touched his food and it turned to gold and he couldn't eat it anymore so he <laughs> realized uh oh <laughs> problem um the the whole story of Midas is a mistaken desire a desire where we believe that we want something that is you know, we, we think is aspirational, but in fact actually takes us away from what's important, what's really important, what sustains us. So Midas, realising the error of his ways, went wandered off vaguely of his own accord into the forest, hoping for some kind of revelation, and he came across Pan, and Pan took him in and basically healed him. Now, I just love that part of the Midas story because the idea of recovering from this mistaken sense of aspiration, which 
blinds us to what really sustains our lives, what really bl brings us pleasure, what really feeds and nourishes our sense of humanity and connection with the world can be recovered by finding some kind of wild aspect of self. So Midas is up here in the eclipse chart. Midas is up here in gate 16. No, it's not. Oh, I've said here it is. Just let me see if I can find it. <laughs> sometimes, now you will well know because I've done it before, sometimes I am on the wrong chart. Let's see where it is. It's in gate 20. So it's just about to move to gate 16 the day after. That was probably on the 11th, I think, that I looked at it in. So it's in gate 20. So it's making a channel with that gate 57. And then it immediately goes into gate 16 where it's making a channel with Mackie Mackie. And we already know, I've already mentioned that Mackie Mackie represents a capacity to be able to reclaim our own observational perspective, to let go of seeing things from someone else's perspective. That's one aspect of Mackie Mackie. Okay, so um, sh 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 that's Midas. I love that. I love that. You'll see where that plays into to the story a little bit more as we go on. Uh, so I just want to come back down here to the 42 for a minute. I did read the 42.2, which was that channel to spirits is open, invest your full self in response to change. Um, gate 42, line 5, so Mercury exactly conjunct Eris, which represents there will be chaos. <laughs> there, will, there will be this sense of shocking exposés of of coming to the realization of being able to see things that you were previously blind to it you know it's i think it's not even that shocking things will happen but that you will see things in a shocking new way that's that's my take on it probably some shocking things will happen but i think it's very much about you about your perspective that's shifting uh 42 line 5 this is all from hillary barrett by the way um the heart of this is the heart of the blessing this is the power to recreate the whole circulation that sustains you. It, the, to me, this is fundamental to what is happening in April, which is that we are making a shift from what we believe is sustaining us. I couldn't say it more simply and purely, I think, than that. Um, if we come down into the 53 here, we have... I've been looking at all the centaurs. I just been so longing to do this. Uh, 53, 6. So it's in 53 um, here and also on, which is the eclipse, and also on the 11th when the sun is conjunct Mercury in the 53, uh, sorry, in the 42. And uh, a checklist represents, this is from, um, ah, here it is. Um, the Benjamin Adaman Centaurs Damocloids Scattered Disc Objects, SDOs, which is Sedna. Um, and so a checklist. An urge to achieve prestige as a remedy for constant for a constant state of uncertainty. Now, if you think about someone who's having a hard time, quite it's quite common for that person to, for example, wish they could win the lottery. That will solve all my problems. If I could just have enough money, you know, a couple of million dollars and I'll be out of this problem. It's much less common for people to say, I need to invest more in my relationships because it is people who will support me when I'm having problems. And I think that's Again, at the core of this thing, if we go back to the 42.5, um, the heart of blessing and the power to recreate the whole circulation that sustains you, it's not money. <laughs> Just to quote some famous um, uh, Native American chieftain, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that going around. It's not money that sustains us. Um, so a checklist represents a shift in understanding that 
when we're in a state of uncertainty, it is not prestige, it is not money, it is not influence, it is not power which will sustain us. And nor is it a further investment of ourselves into that world, into the world that is trying to achieve all of those things. That's not what we should be doing now. If we have a look at um, Venus has just gone up to the 17 in the chart here in the um, eclipse chart. But just before that, she's exactly conjunct Neptune in gate 36, line 6. And just let me read that to you. Let me find it and I will read it to you. Uh, will I or won't I? Let me put the pause on. Forget that. It was something else. It was 3.6, which I'll get to, not 36. Um, so let's just move on from there. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to go to, just for a moment, and then I'll come back, I want to go to this um, Jupiter conjunct Uranus chart, which is the 21st of April. Um, the reason I want to go here is because I just want to talk about Haumea for a moment. Now, Haumea is a dwarf planet. She's in gate 50 at the moment. And you can see here she's in gate 50, line 6. Um, conjunct the Earth on this Jupiter-Uranus chart. And in gate 27, we have Gaia, which is the Earth. Now, also on this day for this chart, we have the Sun square Pluto and opposite Haumea. So I'm here in the community, uh, on the community site now. I'm in the blog here. So I'm scrolling down here to this Pluto square Haumea 2022 to 2028. If you search for Haumea, <clears throat> you'll find this blog post as well. So if we go into this, um, we you can see here that we've got Pluto and Haumea together. We've got Haumea, the essence is found in the cycles of life. She renews, regenerates and restores. The anti-Armageddon planet working to restore our faith in life's ability to move forward creatively rather than destructively. She brings our attention to all things life-supporting. She reorients destructive energy into natural cyclical patterns and aids our emergence into a new state of being, impelling the evolution of new life forms. In concert with Pluto, Haumea strips away anything in the personality that is not in the highest expression of soul takes the old destructive energies released by Pluto and uses them to rebuild and rebirth a new emergent self. Now here we have, oh, that's not what I want. Um, <laughs> that's not what I want at all. I wanted to go to courses. Let's go there. And um, to look at the minor planet treasury because I'm pretty sure... I popped in here a whole, yeah, look, birthing innovation. Um, there are 13 squares to Haumea between 2022 and 2028. That's in here. All of these, um, they're all here, right? If you, want the, if you want the hard data, it's all there. But also I've done a 30-minute video here on Haumea for you, really to talk about um, the, the this huge shift that this Pluto Haumea um, square ongoing is is bringing and in particular just a few notes cyclical transformation Haumea cannot exist in a controlled environment but must have access to the wild world and its abundance so think about Pan and Midas going to Pan right to recover from that desire to find happiness in in wealth and prosperity and influence and power and those things um, creating a greater net of consciousness that arises from the void so our capacity to draw consciousness from the void and create culture from it to embed human consciousness within earthly existence now this 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 in a <laughs> 
there's a lot in that <laughs> just letting that roll through a little bit this is a huge thing because Halmea is like the ma the mother matrix for the crux point in a sense for earthly existence and cosmic awareness I'm going to put it that way um, the cosmic nature of things and connection of in a sense connection of the earth human to the cosmic human so the that's what these Pluto, that's what these Pluto Haumea connections are about because if you remember that Pluto um, from my perspective it, Pluto when it was uh, reduced from being a plant not reduced uh, changed from being a dwarf planet to a planet a uh, sorry planet to a dwarf planet what that did was it put Pluto it took Pluto out of direct relationship with the other planets Neptune and Uranus in particular those transpersonal planets and brought it into direct relationship with the other dwarf planets Haumea, Maki Maki, uh, Eris, Sedna for example um, it, it, it meant that Pluto was now less about transformation which is something that's passed to Ceres now which is also Ceres is a dwarf planet that orbits between Mars and Jupiter it transferred that transformational capacity that we had allocated previously to Pluto and it gave Pluto a new function which was as a doorway to galactic consciousness so the, I can't underestimate how significant these Pluto squares to Haumea are and we have one happening right pretty much right on this solar eclipse um, sorry not that it's pretty much right on the Jupiter conjunct Uranus where the uh, at the time the earth is sitting right on top of Haumea and Gaia is in gate 27 Gaia is an asteroid um, which represents our connection to earth but also the collective human consciousness and what we do with it and this channel is about creating new caring culture a, a society that actually uh, prioritizes care for each other and survival issues right rather than um, trying to <laughs> do all those other things um, okay so that's that page let's go on to the next one still here one more thing I just want to say or two more things I want to say about this chart firstly if we go up here to gate 23 this is where we have Jupiter and Uranus in gate 23 line 4 let me just read you what that let me just tell you a couple of things about this Jupiter and Uranus together imagining new possibilities that would previously have seemed to be unconventional or unimaginable detaching from old customs and habits um, just ex the suddenly uh, suddenly the um, things that were outside the bounds of normal possibility become acceptable right and 23 4 um, talks about so 23 is this gate that says uh, the things that we don't need anymore are going to fall away let's just let them go <laughs> I just want to mention actually gate 50 one of the aspects of gate 50 is that it sorts through what we need from it, it gate 50 is the end of an era gate 50 is the celebration of a new emperor a new era uh, and it's about actually choosing the things that we're going to bring forward because they still have value to us or saying that's in the past we don't need to bring that forward into the new era with us just so you know so going back to 23 similar kind of idea but much more chaotic much more about and and I use that in the true term of chaos not in the Greek term of chaos which is disorder so gate 23 line 4 um, the sleeper awakens um, you've been given fair warning but until now you've not seen the the, the damage that's being done here um, we have uh, unsustainable behavior basically you're waking up to a situ situation and suddenly suddenly realizing it's unsustainable to continue on in this way so again that same kind of theme right a blind spot waking up seeing things that you previously couldn't see that were outside of the bounds of what you were 
in a sense allowed to see. So um, I just want to go to here. Oh, we're already here. And I want to mention that Pandora is very, very close, just one line off from that Jupiter Uranus activation. The reason I want to mention Pandora is because Pandora means all gifted. Before Pandora became the plaything of Zeus, where he made her a curse, um, he Pandora was a, an earlier Earth goddess who represented the the profound nature of the gifts uh, that that the Earth gave to humanity. Oh, he won't cry now. Um, but instead. Instead, Zeus turned her into a curse, <laughs> turned those gifts into a curse, made the gifts of nature something to be demonized and avoided. And if we go to, if we look at Pandora from a personal perspective, if you want to look at her in your human design chart, look to see the, in that position, that center and that gate, this is a place where you are highly gifted, where you have a lot of gifts to offer, but you have been led to believe that for some reason those gifts are a curse and you should, you know, Pandora taking the lid off the jar and the curse is being released, right? You should keep a lid on that jar. And I find that people have a real sense of that physical feeling of wanting to keep a lid on that aspect of themselves. The other thing I love too, and remember we've got Manwe, Lord of Grace and um, Rebalancer of Karma. And in Gate 43, we have Kali who also has the same function. Um, she is definitely a balancer of karma. Uh, so Kali in the 43, it's a very interesting archetype there. And I look, there's one more thing I want to talk about here which is the idea of civilization versus culture. We, You might not have ever thought about the word civilization. To tell you the truth, I'd never really thought about it much either. But you think about the idea of being civilized and what it actually means. Civil, the word civilization was first used in France in the 1750s. It's one of those things that you just think is kind of always existed. But it, it was... It was an idea that came about at around the time of the discovery of Uranus. It was being used deliberately to distinguish civilised people from savages and it's only ever served to rank societies based on these subjective traits of, you know, whether you, can use, whether you know which is the correct fork to use at dinner rather than how much a society contributes to shared human ideals. That becomes unimportant when we're looking at the ranking of, of how civilised someone is. Uh, it was also about this time that the races were ranked, right, and that white people suddenly decided that they were at the top. <laughs> okay, and then, and then we got this idea of the West, and we can see in the way the West and its civilizing influence has to be defended from the uncivilized, which represents chaos and, and this subtle way that we can tyrannize and dehumanize the uncivilized, the, um, the inhuman. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, prior to prior to this idea of civilization, funnily enough, and I think this is uh, surprising for a lot of people, was surprising for me, um, that connection and trade and migration and mobility were at least people travelled at least as much prior to agriculture as they did afterwards. Um, there was a there were there have been tremendous findings of things so far away from their origin because the trade routes all around the world were astonishing. Just going back to Mackie Mackie, and the people who settled um, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, where, where Mackie Mackie is the creator god originally, those people came from South America. They came from Chile. They they 
rode on their kayaks 3,000 miles through the ocean <laughs> to get there. And they did it because they had tremendous, a tremendous capacity to navigate. Um, oh, I've, read, I've read about this and it, it just blows my mind and it's so beautiful. They can tell from the types of fish, the types of birds, the direction the birds are moving in, um, the colour of the water, the movement of the currents, um, the way the wind interacts with the water, um, the, the, all of these subtle signals, obviously the stars and where they sit in, you know, on the, on the um, water in relationship to the stars above them, all of these things tell them where they are. All of these things help them to navigate and orient themselves. Um, so migration and my mobility are part of history. Connection and trade are part of history. A civilization is a way to tyrannize and dehumanize people and to rank people. It takes no account of um, how much any particular society contributes to shared human ideals. Even the idea of shared human ideals is who even talks about that now, right? But it's important. And I think it's that thing is coming back to say, hang on. If I keep doing this, I'm going to lose my humanity. And I've just written at the top of my page, civilization versus culture, because culture is something I'm really passionate about. And if we look at the idea of culture, culture is embedded in place. It's the everyday practices that we engage in as we come together and have a shared life. And uh, culture drives evolution it's it's culture that brings about art and music and and dance and you know all of those things get, that's all gate 16 by the way the, the celebration of culture through arts um, and the idea of civilization actually destroys culture literally actually destroys culture so you've only got to see you know the bombing of universities and hospitals and all kinds of things in um, Gaza to see the way in which civilization dehumanizes and destroys culture. Okay, back to the eclipse chart. Nearly, we're nearly done. I just want to talk about this 51.5575 for now. Um, let me see where I want to... Here we are. Okay, so 51.5. Oh, uh, do you know what? There was something I hadn't shown you. I'm going to jump back to this. Did I? No. Uh, look, I'm not going to open the chart, but I just want to tell you that in the holographic human design chart, um, the USA on the 1st of April, so just yesterday, um, the the design layer sun and earth shifted into gate 11 line one and in a, in 12 line one so i'm just the us has just yesterday shifted into a new six year holographic solar cycle on the design side this always brings massive change it's also um Oh, I haven't got the chart open, but also um, the Mars has just shifted as well. I don't have the date for that, but it's in line one, so it's only just shifted. And I find when Mars shifts, it brings about a 10-year, a new 10-year Mars cycle, which is massive. But I wanted to read to you, and I'm sorry I'm doing this out of alignment with, out of the flow um, of the story, but I just really want to come back to this. So the sun in the holographic chart will be in gate 11, and... Um, or is now for the next six years. Um, and it, gate 11 is full, free and full expression of tremendous creative energy. Gate 11 and gate 42 are the most positive energies in the human design chart. Gate 12 is obviously the partnering or complementary gate to gate 11. It's a gate of blockage. I'm just going to read this. It says, it's futile to try to fix everything at once. Can I just say this? Gate 12 is not an object which is a block. Gate 12 is the advice for how to move through blockages. Just It's a process like all the gates. So gate 12, 
it's it's futile to try to fix everything at once you what it talks about is is a matted lot of grass that you need to pull up but all the roots are tangled together and and you look at it and you think i can never do that and it says don't try and fix everything at once pull on a single clump that fits within your grasp in other words only take on what's right there in front of you and work at that because that's the thing if we each do that this is the basis actually for this is the basis for this article building a global immune system which if you just go to love your design and type in immune you'll find it um, and this idea that um, I, I really I have to say I really love this article and it it's not one that gets out in the world much it's only got 81 shares but um, that that idea of just grasping hold of what we can in front of us that is what this is all about and right at the end I talk about um, how important it is I can't even find it now um, how important it is that we do the thing that <laughs> okay it's all there you can have a look at it that we do the thing that's right in front of us we do the thing that's ours to do that's all we have to do we don't have to do more than that the issues you face are deeper and more far-reaching than you realize but so too will be the benefits so again this idea of um if you try and pull it out all at once you're operating on the basis that you know what the problem is and in fact you don't so don't try and take it all in at once. So that's if you're in the USA, that's a really important um, influence at the moment. And as I said, I think the USA has such a fundamental role to play in these shifts. So I think that's important. Okay, let's have a look here. Gate 51, line one, where we've got the sun, the moon, and and um, Chiron. Now, Chiron, of course, I've said represents something where we have a blind spot, right? So if we look at the sun and the moon, what we have is our outer self and our inner self. And I talked about that in the um, video that I did on Monday, which was kind of a weekly wrap. So just maybe scroll back down and have a look at that if you um, if you haven't watched it. But this idea of the integration of our inner and outer self of our masculine and feminine, that is a part of this Chiron activation. Gate 51, line one is a gate that says the shock opens up the way for new possibilities to come to the fore. Um, it's an omen that the human world is about to be brought back into harmony. The solid ground shifts under your feet. Security slips away. Mental constructs shatter. And I love this. Living reality has spoken. I can feel the voice, living reality. It's it's living reality here. Um, it's time to hold on to what you most value and take responsibility for keeping it safe. So important. Keep a still point amidst the tumult of reactivity. Don't lose your connection with the creative power that speaks through the storms. The things that collapse have ended. The things that move take their place. And it's, it's for you to allow novelty to come into being rather than allowing novelty to turn to fear through inaction. There's a very important theme here about movement, how important it is to keep moving. I just want to have a look at Alicia. Not so much Astro Wizard. Astro Wizard haunting me. Astro Wizard's haunting me saying, when are you going to talk about me? Um, okay, so that um, that's gate 51. And then gate 57. <clears throat> Gate 57 to me is one of the most profound gates in human in the human design chart because it, for now because it represents the way in which we are able to stay present in our bodies and notice what we are in relationship with and the way in which those relationships create our reality. Um, 
And, you know, Uranus is about to go into 20 um, when it's finished in eight, so in about a year's time, and that will be the completion of Uranus's time in the individual circuitry. So finalising that individual circuitry will be in gate 20, the gate of presence, and activating gate 57. Gate 57, line five, is about penetrating to the core of the matter. This enables you to bring about real change, to know what's valuable, Allow yourself time to consider what has led you to this moment and what is taking shape now. It's most important to, to bring yourself back to your own lived experience and to validate that. Coming back to that idea of the missing observer syndrome, don't fall prey to the syndrome of uh, of gaslighting yourself that your own experience is less important less valid um, less contributive to to moving forward and creating change than zeus zeus's um, viewpoint so this this very important idea of staying present um, keeping that still point amidst the tumult of reactivity and allowing time to consider what's led you to this moment and what is taking shape now. Everything I see is saying something is being birthed now, a new consciousness is being birthed now, and it's so important. It's so important that we, that we stay present and give birth to it. Now, just to finish up, up here in Gate 63, we have Mars and Saturn. They're going to be exactly conjunct in 63-4 on the 10th, so two days after the eclipse. Gate 63, I sometimes call 63 and 64 the spiritual midwifery gates. It's like you have this um, uh, information, this um, inspiration coming through but it's still just at the level of inspiration. It's not even at the level of thought yet. But I love what Hilary Barrett says about the 63, where she says, you've set an intention. You might not even necessarily be so aware of it consciously, um, but you, on some level, you've committed yourself to a change. You've already made a transition on some level. Um, and now it's about just uh, following through on that intention, staying loyal to your original reasons for setting this intention and making this commitment. So have a think about what that might be for you. In line four, where they are conjunct on the 10th, it says, this is a fragile situation. Nothing can be taken for granted. The moment you take something for granted, you assume that you know what's going on and that's not the place to be at the moment. It's really important to get comfortable in the place of being really present with what you are experiencing without drawing too much in the way of judgment. Now over here in the 64, which is of course the um, complementary gate to the 63, we have the dwarf planet Orcus in line four. So it's exactly opposite where Saturn and Mars are going to come together. Just, just briefly, Mars gives us the courage to break down the old rigid barriers, uh, um, structures of Saturn. I'll, I'll just, there are other ways of interpreting it, but let's just look at it that way. Um, uh, I suppose the other thing I could potentially say is that Mars also gives the courage to begin a new Journey. Saturn represents stability, building something stable and of long-term value. So Mars could also bring the courage, that kind of warrior strength to take on that new um, project, if you like, that, that new uh, um, journey of what we're working towards. And sitting right opposite is Orcus and... Orcus represents the beginning of a new soul mission. So I think this is not just a birthing of new consciousness, um, but also on a personal level, the courage for us to recognise our commitment to our own new journey, our own new soul mission, 
and also to begin to see our uh, the, the, and this is the Jupiter-Uranus um, conjunction, which comes on the 21st of April. That brings the capacity for us to be able to see our individual role within the big picture and to really have faith in our ability to step into that role. So I think that'll do us. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming on that journey with me and uh, enjoy the next few days.